Welcome to the fifth episode in a Legendarium series about the Carthaginians. In part five, Hannibal at the Gates, we will talk about one of the greatest military leaders in history, Hannibal Barca, and his brutal war against the Roman Republic. He won many crushing victories against Rome, and in the end, the Romans could only beat the unbeatable Hannibal by refusing to fight him. Hannibal's Numidian cavalry became the key to his first great victory over Rome at the Tachinus River. He used his Numidian horsemen to bait the Roman cavalry into chasing them and then suddenly turning around and surrounding the Romans in turn. This created chaos and confusion, the opposite of what the highly disciplined Romans wanted. By the end of the battle, Hannibal broke up their lines and slaughtered 2,000 Romans. Publius Cornelius Scipio suffered injury during the fight, and the Romans replaced him with the temperamental Tiberius Sempronius Longus, whom Hannibal played like a liar. The two sides met again on a gray, snowy November day at the Trebia River. Hannibal took advantage of the freezing temperatures and the Roman commander's temper by sending his cavalry across the river. The shocked Romans staggered out of their tents to see sentries and cooks being butchered by Numidian horsemen. As the Carthaginians fled across the river, Longus ordered his men to plunge into the freezing Trebia River in pursuit. His 40,000 men hurled themselves into the icy water and then on the other side organized themselves into a checkerboard formation designed for attack. However, Hannibal had his elephants, which charged at the flanks of the Roman infantry. Romans scattered in sheer terror. Hannibal soon surrounded the panicked Romans on three sides with his cavalry and his elephants. The Carthaginians pushed the Romans back into the river, and the Romans suffered staggering losses, losing 30,000 out of 40,000 men. This marked their worst defeat since the sack of Rome in 390 BC. However, Hannibal suffered his own losses too. All but one of his elephants died of starvation or wounds, so Hannibal took the sole survivor, Styria, as his personal mount. Meanwhile, Rome responded by raising four more legions under the command of two new consuls, Gnaeus Servilius Gaminus and Gaius Flaminius. The two commanders headed north and split their forces. Gaminus traveled northeast while Flaminius headed northwest. They hoped to force Hannibal to march through a vast swamp filled with muck, insects, and snakes that lay between them. The Romans assumed that Hannibal would give battle to one of them rather than march through such a marsh. Instead, Hannibal did the unexpected and marched straight through, but again at a cost. An insect stung him in the eye, it grew infected, and he wound up blind in one eye. Nonetheless, Hannibal began burning the Tuscan countryside, incinerating whole farms and villages. He even marched his army straight past the walls of Eretium, where Flaminius commanded the garrison. Mortified at the atrocities and fearful he allowed Rome to look weak to the subject Italian states, Flaminius left his fort and gave chase. Hannibal led him on a wild goose chase across Tuscany while he searched for the perfect place to give battle. He found it at Lake Tresemine, which had a narrow passageway between cliffs and a lake called a defile. Even better, a fog came off the lake and covered the valley, so Hannibal ordered his men to light campfires miles away to convince the Romans that he still camped far beyond the defile. The Romans, half blinded by the fog, followed the faraway campfires. Soon enough, the Roman vanguard encountered the famed Numidian cavalry. After a brief fight, the Numidians made another feigned retreat which the Roman vanguard pursued. Then Hannibal sprung one of the deadliest traps in history. Hannibal ambushed the Romans between the lake and the cliff. The Romans, with their weapons sheathed and not in battle formation, were helpless. In three hours, Hannibal's men slaughtered 15,000 of Rome's 20,000 men. By the age of 27, Hannibal had become a legend. 
Rome, desperate and terrified, appointed a temporary dictator named Quintus Fabius Maximus. Fabius adopted an unorthodox strategy to beat the unbeatable Hannibal. He refused to fight. Though he raised 90,000 new soldiers, he had his men follow Hannibal and ambush his foraging parties and patrols. If a town gave Hannibal refuge, they burned it to the ground. Though one of history's greatest military leaders, Hannibal could not resupply his army or take Rome by siege. He found himself leading a small, hungry army deep in enemy territory. However, Rome's Fabian strategy depended on political will. The Roman way involved giving battle, not running from it. So after Fabius's six-month term expired, two new consuls took command, convinced that Hannibal had been weakened and could be defeated. Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Gaius Terentius Varro led 86,000 Romans against Hannibal's 40,000 Carthaginians. Hannibal gave battle near a ruined fortress in a rich agricultural center so his men could eat before the battle. One of Hannibal's officers, Gisco, grew fearful at being outnumbered two to one by the Romans. Hannibal asked Gisco why he trembled, and of course, Gisco replied that he feared the Roman numbers. There is one more thing you have not noticed, Hannibal said. What is that, sir? Gisco asked. In all that great number of men opposite, there is not a single one whose name is Gisco, Hannibal answered. The nearby officers laughed at Hannibal's retort, and smiles spread even to the rank-and-file soldiers, calming their nerves. Hannibal deployed his men in a concave bow, like a semicircle, leading the infantry from the middle of the line while his cavalry held the flanks. A fierce battle erupted in the middle of the Carthaginian line, and the infantry began to give ground. Once the Romans saw the center falling back, they sent reinforcements to the center, hoping to break the Carthaginian line. However, Hannibal planned this. Hannibal's cavalry kept the flanks intact, so the Carthaginian lines became V-shaped as the center fell back, and the Romans inside the V became so tightly packed that their arms pinned against their bodies, and they couldn't even lift their swords. Then, the Carthaginians rushed the Romans from the side and the rear, jamming them into a killing ground. Rome's army was not simply defeated, it was annihilated. Over 70,000 Romans died in a day within an area twice the size of Central Park. It took six hours to kill that many people with swords and spears. About one in 15 Roman men of military age died that day, bloodier than even the worst days of World War II when 50,000 men died. After this fourth nightmarish defeat, Hannibal hoped that Rome would either make peace or collapse. Indeed, cities in southern Italy began defecting to him, which must have strengthened that hope. However, he knew that he did not have the equipment to besiege Rome. So while Hannibal offered peace, the Senate not only refused, they outlawed the word peace, forbidding any Roman citizen from even talking about it. The Romans, to defeat the unbeatable Hannibal, returned to the Fabian strategy. Roman soldiers avoided battle, only sending small bands to slaughter Hannibal's foraging parties and patrols. Even worse for Hannibal, he had to provide garrisons for the cities in southern Italy. This drained away manpower already sapped by slow attrition. His men soon grew exhausted with unprofitable and difficult garrison duty, so they went home in great numbers. The ruling council of Carthage had long been skeptical of Hannibal, and when he failed to deliver outright victory, they sent no help. Meanwhile, a Roman named Publius Cornelius Scipio invaded first Iberia and then Carthage. In 203 BC, after spending 15 years undefeated in Italy, Hannibal had to return home to North Africa to save Carthage from Roman invasion led by Scipio. In 202 BC, Hannibal met with Scipio to talk terms. We have no idea what they said to each other, but they did not make peace. The Battle of Zama followed, and Hannibal endured defeat for the first time in his life. Thus, the, first, the Second Punic War ended the same as the first, with Carthage defeated. This time, Roman peace terms proved far harsher. Carthage lost all its overseas possessions, left only with North Africa. 
its fleet, the basis of its power and wealth, had to be burned. On top of that, it still had to pay a massive war indemnity to Rome intended to bankrupt it. However, Hannibal had not finished. With Carthage forced to disband its army, Hannibal turned to politics. He won election as Sufet, or chief magistrate, and set about reforming the government. He blamed the Council of 104 for failing to send reinforcements, so he limited its members to serve for only two years, which broke up the aristocratic power blocks that long dominated the governing council. In doing so, he also removed much corruption from the government, as these power blocks could no longer keep their cronies in office, and that allowed for reparations to be paid without overtaxing Carthage. Remembering the mercenaries who rebelled against his father when they did not receive payment, he gave veterans of the Second Punic War land and trained them in farming. Indeed, Carthage's prosperity grew so great that in 191 BC, the state paid its entire war indemnity of 8,000 talents 30 years ahead of schedule. Rome became fearful once more, as did Hannibal's enemies on the council. The Roman Senate sent a commission to Carthage to investigate charges that Hannibal connived with King Antiochus, an enemy of Rome. Hannibal knew his enemies in Carthage had fed Rome the rumor, so he fled to Antiochus's court in Bithynia. Antiochus put Hannibal in charge of his fleet for a war against Eumenes II of Pergamon, a Roman ally. Hannibal filled pots with venomous snakes, hurled them onto enemy decks, and the Pergamon fleet scattered. Despite these initial successes, Rome intervened after the Senate learned that Hannibal took refuge in Bithynia. They ordered Antiochus to hand him over or face invasion. Rather than fall into Roman hands, Hannibal fled further east into Armenia, but soon learned that the Armenian king planned to hand him over. With no friends left and in his 60s, Hannibal committed suicide by drinking poison. Before his death, Hannibal is said to have written, Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comment section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.